Hello everyone, I'm Lucy Keller from Historic Beverly. Today I'm going to talk to you about this spinning wheel that we have in our collection and how it was used to make fabric for clothing. We also have several other items related to spinning wheels and making fabric, so I will be sharing some of those with you later. You can also search Historic Beverly's online collection available on our website at www.historicbeverly.net for other items related to textiles, spinning, and weaving. Spinning wheels are used to take a natural fiber, such as wool from a sheep or goat, and flax from a flax plant, and spin it into a yarn or thread that can be used to make fabric. The fabric would then be used to make clothing or other household articles. Wool is spun into a yarn or thread that can be woven, knit, or crocheted into garments and other articles. Flax is spun into a thread that can be woven on a loom to create fabric from which clothing or other house household articles can be made. Wool and flax are very different fibers that require different types of spinning wheels. They are also prepared for spinning very differently. There were two distinct kinds of spinning wheels used to make fabric. Here you can see both types of spinning wheel. In the front, just left of center, the smaller spinning wheel is a flax wheel. In the back, near the window on the right, is the larger wool wheel. This woman is working on a wool wheel spinning wool into yarn. Whether wool yarn or linen thread, the fibers would have to go through a long process before they could even get spun into yarn or thread. For this talk, since our spinning wheel on display is a flax spinning wheel, I will share with you only the flax process. We also have this flax kit at Historic Beverly, so I can show you examples of each step in the process after the flax is harvested. We primarily show the flax kit at Balch House, so if you ever have a chance to go to Balch House, you may be able to see it there. The picture on the left is from a field of flax with a close-up of the flax flower. In colonial times, it took about a year to make flax into cloth. Colonists planted about a quarter of an acre for each person in the family. That would provide about 10 to 20 yards of linen for each person's clothing. Men's shirts used about three yards, women's petticoats about the same. Colonists usually only got one new set of clothes a year due to the very labor intensive process. The picture on the right shows you the multiple individual fibers in the flax stem that will be eventually be used to make the linen. See those fine threads? The flax plants will mature in about three months when the bottom of the flat plant turns yellow and the lower leaves start falling off. That is when you plan to harvest the flax. Bowls will have begun to develop. A bowl is basically a seed pod. Even after you harvest the flax plants, the seeds in the bowl will continue to ripen as the flax plant dries. We'll show you a flax plant with bowls on one of the upcoming slides. Unlike most crops, you harvest the flax by pulling it fully from the ground, like you see this man here. You do not cut it. The fiber in the stem of the plant goes from the top of the plant all the way to the bottom of the root. So it's usually about two and a half to three and a half feet long. Pulling the flax instead of cutting ensures the fiber that is inside provides longer fibers to make it easier for spinning and it reduces a waste of perfectly good fiber. In this picture, you can see the harvester pulling up the plants and gathering them into small bundles, usually called shocks, that are tied together, either using another flax plant or other material to tie. To the left of the harvester, where the arrow and bracket are, you can see the shocks that have already been harvested and 
put together. After harvesting is done, the shocks will either be stood up in the field to encourage even drying, or the shocks will be turned over regularly to ensure all parts of the shock dry properly and evenly. Most of the next few pictures are items from our flax kit that was seen earlier, unless it is otherwise noted. This is an example of still green flax that has been harvested and allowed to dry in a shock. Here you can see on the right side end the small round pods or bowls as they are called for flax plants. While the flax is drying in the shocks, as I mentioned earlier, the seeds actually continue to ripen in the bowl. After it has initially dried, then the seed pods or bowls are removed in a process called rippling, where the flax straw is pulled through a rippling comb, which is often a single row of long nails set closely together in a base, perhaps something like this on the left. The seed pods were broken with flails to release the seeds. The center picture has a farmer using a flail to thresh grain. A flail is two slender pieces of wood connected by a chain. One stick is used to swing the other stick to strike the seed bowls lightly, breaking open the husks to release the seeds. You can see how small the flax seeds are in the picture on the right. They are about the same size as sesame seeds. Enough seeds would be saved for planting the next year. The remaining seeds would be taken to a mill to be pressed for flaxseed or linseed oil. The seed oil was used for paint, printer's ink, and to burn in oil lamps for light. The mashed seed pulp was used to add nutritional value to animal feed. Today, of course, we know flax seeds and their oil can also be used to supplement our human diets as well. We also can use the flaxseed oil as an excellent way to season our cast iron pans. After the flax has initially dried after pulling, then it has to go through a process called retting, which is ex essentially a rotting process. The rot retting process helps break down the plant material surrounding the fiber contained in the plant's long stem, which makes it easier to separate the flax fiber from the plant material. For British colonists, Retting would have meant putting the dried flax shocks into water for about a week or two. The water process turns the plant in fiber to a blonde color and then it is set to dry. For German colonists, retting was typically done by leaving the shocks to continue drying in the field for four to six weeks. This drying process turns the flat plant in fiber to a silvery gray color. The next step is to break the flax, to loosen the plant material along the flax fiber. This painting on the left shows a woman breaking flax in a flax break. The painting was done by Jean-Francois Millet in the mid 1800s. On the right, you can see how broken flax looks. There is still a lot of plant material with the fiber but you can start to see a distinct separation of the plant material from the fiber. There are different types of flax breaks, but one of the simplest, shown here on the left, looks like a rectangular box with a deep, narrow center. The break is a long, narrow wooden blade or paddle that operates lever-like. As the lever in the wooden blade or paddle is lowered, and partially filled the, fills the deep narrow center, it bends and cracks the plant stem material around the plant flax fiber without breaking or tearing the flax fiber. The picture on the right shows a closer view of a woman today using a flax break. Now the plant material has now been broken into small sections that can now be more easily removed in the next process called scutching. On the left, this fresco on canvas by Mayer Dahan shows women scutching flat flax. The scutching process uses a wooden knife and a wooden board. A large bundle of the flax is pulled gently 
between the wooden blade and the wooden board, which removes much of the plant fiber that was still left on the fibers after the breaking. As you can see in the picture on the right, scooching was fairly effective at removing the majority of the remaining plant material from the fiber. Now the flax is ready for the next step, the last one before spinning. This device on the left that looks like a medieval torture device is called a hackling or heckling board. It is used in the flax processing. It is a board with many nails pointed end up, close together with even spacing. The scutched flax is pulled gently through this comb, which straightens and separates the long fibers, which can then be used to spit, be spun into be thread. The remaining plant material and smaller or coarser fibers like you, the one you see in the picture on the right remain behind in the comb and are often called toe fiber. Toe fiber shown on the left here is gathered from the comb and used for a variety of other purposes. The toe fiber could be used to make rope or a very coarse cloth. It was also used to stuff, stuff mattresses, clean muzzle-loading rifles, and as a fire starter. The picture on the right shows the longer fibers after combing. These are the fibers that will be spun into thread to be used to weave linen. See how smooth they are compared to the toe fiber and to the earlier scutched flax? The long, smooth fibers were often braided or twisted into something like this, called a mini strip the picture on the left. These stricks helped to keep the combed fiber smooth and untangled while in storage. This made it easier to spin them into thread later, usually during the long winter months on a spinning wheel like this one on the right that is on display here at Cabot House. So how exactly does the spinning wheel work? Well, on the left here is a diagram that we found on Wikipedia of a spinning wheel similar to our spinning wheel. It is a complete spinning wheel. On the right is our spinning wheel, which is missing the drive band. Also, our spinning wheel has what is called a bird cage distaff, rather than the rod-like distaff in the diagram. Otherwise, you'll be able to see how the parts relate to each other. Spinning wheels were made by professional craftsmen. As mentioned earlier, Flax wheels were small, usually about one and a half feet in diameter. This is a very simplified explanation of how spinning wheels work. The long flax fibers that were stored in the strick are unbraided and untwisted and placed loosely on the distaff, which is part L. Then the distaff with the fiber is held in one hand while the foot powered treadle parts G through J there, makes the wheel spin. The turning of the wheel, part A, operates a device that is nicknamed the mother of all, which includes the parts C through E, and a bobbin, which is part of the flyer assembly in the mother of all. The parts of the mother of all work together to twist the fiber into single ply linen thread and draw it onto the bobbin for storage. The tension screw seen here adjusts the tension, which affects the amount of twist there will be in the spun thread. This is an example of hand spun linen thread. An experienced spinner can spin about five yards of thread a minute. A smart spinner will always spin the thread in the same direction for their initial spin. Flax has a natural counterclockwise tendency, so it is recommended to spin it counterclockwise for your initial thread. If you are going to make double ply thread, you simply take two single ply threads that are already spun and you spin them to twist them together in the opposite direction, clockwise. It is estimated that nearly two miles of thread approximately 3,520 yards, is used to make a piece of cloth that is 10 feet long and about two feet wide. That 
is nearly 12 hours of spinning thread to make just over three yards of fabric, only two feet wide. Estimates say that it usually takes about seven spinners to keep one weaver busy. Looms can range in size from the large floor size model on the left to the small lamp loom on the right. At Balch House, we have a small standing loom that is called a tape loom. Check it out next time you visit the Balch House. This is an example of what machine made linen cloth looks like. Linen is usually a lightweight natural fabric that is favored for spring and summer wear, just like cloth cotton. So if you have any questions, you can send them to research at historicbeverly.net and we will do our best to answer them. We are not experts in spinning or weaving by any means, but we can find out, see if we can find out the answer for you. If you are not, a, if you are already a member, you can see more programs like this up on our YouTube channel, or you can watch for us on our webpage for upcoming programs that we have. If you aren't already a member, you can become a member of Historic Beverly and get our printed newsletter twice a year and twice monthly emails about upcoming events and brief topics that are discussed. You can also follow us on Instagram. Look for, just look for Historic Beverly. You can also text, text to give to support future programs to 443-21, HistBev. So many of the images in this, in this presentation were from our, uh, for, were from our collection, such as the flax, collection, the flax seed um, kit. But most of the other images were from online other images, and they are seen here from Wikimedia Commons, Wikipedia, Pixels, Needpix, and other programs. They are all were public found as public domain pictures. Thank you for joining us today for the Spotlight Talk. We hope to see you at another program soon. Thank you.